Hello everyone! Belated Happy New Year and Happy Chinese New Year to all! Apologies for not being able to post more Japan travel videos yet. Please be assured we will resume after sharing about our first trip for 2024. We just got back from our 5-day DIY budget trip to Kuala Lumpur. We enjoyed a lot of good but cheap local food and visited different areas, including two-day trips to Genting Highlands and Putrajaya. In the coming series of videos on our KL trip, we will share different travel tips, our amazing food experience, daily activities and expenses. We promise to give you a lot of useful and money-saving tips and recommendations. In this video, we will share about the current Malaysia travel requirements, where to get Malaysian ring it, the recommended areas to stay, navigation tips, essential things to bring and some do's and don'ts to keep in mind as a visitor or traveler. First is the 2024 entry requirements to Malaysia. First is your passport with at least six months validity. Second is a visa if your country is not included in the list of exempted countries. Then the proof of return or exit ticket in hotel or Airbnb booking. Lastly, effective as of January 1, 2024, you need to have accomplished the Malaysia Digital Arrival Card, which we will explain here. Starting January 1, 2024, all foreign visitors must complete and submit the Malaysia Digital Arrival Card or MDAC within three days before arrival in Malaysia. If your flight is AirAsia, they will send you a reminder email which contains the link to the MDAC registration. We will provide the link in the description box. It is mandatory for all foreign citizens except those on the list provided. These are the details you need to provide. After submission, you will receive an email with all the information and a PIN code. Our immigration officer didn't ask for it, so we think they can see it in the system. Nevertheless, we recommend that you take a screenshot or take note of your PIN just in case the immigration officer asks for it. You need to submit MDAC every time you visit Malaysia. If it's your first time MDAC registration, you need to go through an immigration officer. Please note that this is not just for first-time visitors. Even those who visited Malaysia before the MDAC implementation need to do this. For your next visits, you may go through the Autogate already. As an exemption, citizens from these countries are eligible to directly go through the Autogates even on their first-time MDAC enrollment. If you fail to submit your MDAC before arriving in Malaysia, there is a large QR code you can scan at the immigration area to be able to do it before going through immigration. But we strongly recommend that you do it beforehand to avoid any delay, inconvenience, or other issues, especially when you have difficulty getting an internet connection. Now as an additional info on the questions asked by the Malaysian immigration officer, given the premise that it's my second time to visit Malaysia but it was my first trip with the new passport, he asked me who I came with and made me point at my companion. He then just asked for my exit ticket and stamped my passport. If you're traveling solo and it's your first time, there may be more questions but just relax and be confident with your responses. Also, even before stepping in front of the immigration officer, be ready with the documents that they may ask for, like your return ticket, hotel booking, and even your trip itinerary. Next, where can you get Malaysian ringgit? You may choose to buy it from your home country if available and if the exchange rate is good or withdraw from an ATM upon arrival, or bring home currency and exchange it at a money changer. Let's point out some of the pros and cons of each. First, about buying ringgit from your home country. Normally, we buy foreign currencies, especially Japanese yen, Singapore and Hong Kong dollars from Samri's money changer in Glorietta Mall at our home country because their rate is often better, and they often have different currencies on hand. Please note this is not sponsored. But in the case of Thai Bot and Malaysian Ringgit, their rate is not that good, so better get it from the destination country. For this trip, we just bought a few hundred Ringgit and brought our ATM cards and enough Philippine Pesos. It is advantageous to buy and bring some Ringgit with you if your arrival is at an ungodly hour. We always consider the possibility of not being able to withdraw from an ATM at the airport, and exchange rates at the airport are a lot lower. If you're going to bring some ringgit, we recommend that you buy just enough for maybe one to two days until you find an ATM or good money changer at the city. Next is withdrawing money from an ATM upon arrival. More and more people are doing this nowadays. Based on what we've read online, there is no withdrawal fee when you withdraw from ATMs of Malaysian banks, but we don't know for sure. 
Reputable banks include Maybank, Public Bank, and CIMB. Just make sure you make a transaction without currency conversion, so it's your local bank that will convert with their rate. If it's true that Malaysian banks don't charge a withdrawal fee, the advantage of withdrawing is that ATMs are everywhere, and you can just get money as needed. But based on experience, a minor con is that some money changers offer better rates. This image shows the actual ATM exchange rate during our trip. This brings us to the third option, exchanging your home currency at a money changer. This is what we did. You may check out the website Cash Changer to have an idea which money changers offer competitive rates. However, we are not sure which of them do or don't charge any commission or service fee on top. Some say money changers at Bukit Bintang offer good rates. In our case, we exchanged our money at GMT at New Central Mall. The rate at that time was 12.5 Philippine pesos for every ringgit. There's no commission or service fee. Those are the three options. We hope we provided some useful information to help you choose how you would want to get your Malaysian ringgit. By the way, this is a picture of the remaining ringgit we had by the end of our trip. Next, in which area should we find accommodation? Please note that it is coming from our point of view as budget travelers. First is near KL Central Station. This station provides access to the KLIA Express train to and from the airport, the bus terminal to and from the airport, the bus terminal to Genting Highlands, an MRT line, an LRT line, the KTM commuter line, and the KLIA transit that will bring you the fastest to Putrajaya. Other tourist areas like Bukit Bintang, Petaling Street, Patronus Towers and Saloma Link are easily accessible with the available train lines at KL Central. There are several affordable small hotels in the area right across New Central Mall. There are a lot of food options around the area and at New Central. We wanted to stay in this area because of its accessibility, but we just happened to find a hotel in another area that met all our accommodation requirements. Next time we go to KL, we would probably stay near KL Central. The next area is near the Masjid Jamek LRT station. There are several popular walkable places in the area, including the Merdeka Square and surrounding landmarks, Pedaling Street and Sri Maha Mariaman Temple. The area around the station is surrounded by a lot of Indian restaurants while you can walk southward to find a lot of good Chinese restaurants in the Pedaling Street and surrounding streets. You can also easily buy souvenirs and stuff to bring home from Central Market and Maidin. And across my Dean Mall is the terminal of the bus that would take you directly to Putrajaya, including the Pink Mosque and the IOI City Mall, which is the largest mall in Malaysia. This was the area where we stayed. We will have a separate video on our review of the IU Hotel. Just something we kind of didn't like in the area is that there are homeless people who sleep on the sidewalks along the way to the hotel every night. This may be something to take into consideration by female solo travelers, although we neither felt threatened nor did they do anything to make us feel scared. Anyway, my main issue was that my nose was just too sensitive to the smell of human excretions as we passed by. Other than that, we thought the area was a good base. And the last one is near Bukit Bintang Station. Bukit Bintang is the lively and busy area of Kuala Lumpur. Here is where you can see street performances at night. There is a wide range of accommodations in the area. There are a lot of good food areas, including the Lot 10 Hutong Food Court, the Hawker Center in Sunay Wang, Shawarma Spots in the Arab Street, and the popular Jalan Alor Food Street. Different shopping malls are clustered here. You just walk to have drinks at Chang Kat Bukit Bintang. Those are the three areas that we observed would be a good base during your stay in KL. It would just depend on which things you would prefer to be closer to. We hope that helps you shortlist your options when looking for your accommodation in KL. Now even if you choose to stay in other areas, it would not really be an issue because of the good transportation system in KL. They have different train lines that would easily bring you to different areas in and around the city as well as e-hailing services that are really affordable. And in most cases, you can even easily book your bus ticket online. To be honest, coming from the Philippines, we truly admire how modern and organized Malaysia's transportation system is. Now we'd like to provide some information and tips to help you navigate your way to and around KL. First is on traveling between the airport and the city. There are three options, by bus, by train, or by car. The cheapest option is by bus. It brings you straight to KL Central Station in like an hour. It costs between 13 to 15 ringgit only. You may book your ticket in advance on either of those websites. You may even be able to get some discount. 
You can buy the bus ticket on site at these counters near door 2. And the bus platform for this ride to KL Central is right outside door 2. There are other bus lines available online, but we are not sure of its assigned platform. The bus has a huge space for luggage. Please note that you load and unload your own luggage. The driver will just open the compartment, but you may ask him if you need any assistance. When you arrive at KL Central, you need to go up to get to KL Central Station. The escalator near the airport bus is going down. Don't worry. Ask where the ticket booth to Genting Highlands is located. The escalator going up is beside it. From the escalator, you will be walking through this part of the station. From there, you will be able to find your way to New Central Mall and different train lines from KL Central. The second option is by KL Experts Train. It is the fastest but certainly the most expensive way to travel to and from the airport. Each way costs 55 ringgit, which is almost four times the bus ticket price. We consider it the best option only if you are pressed for time. If you're going to take KLIA Express, it will be cheaper to buy your ticket from Kluke. Please note this is not sponsored. Please double check the platform number for KLIA Express because you may end up taking KLIA Transit. The ticket price is the same and you will still reach KL Central but the travel time is a little longer. By the way, you can take KLIA Express using your Touch and Go or TNG card. We will talk more about the TNG card later. Now the third option to travel between the airport and the city is by e-hailing services, namely Grab and Air Asia Ride or AAR. It may be considered the most convenient in terms of traveling directly from the hotel to your accommodation. The cost of the ride varies depending on the distance, size of vehicle you chose, and fare surge. Based on the fare check side of Grab, KLIA 2 to KL Central Station ranges between 55 to 75 ringgit. Please note that the fare shown upon booking does not include the toll fee which will be added to the fare later on. This option is ideal if you're traveling as a group since you can share the fare. Also, this is the best option when you arrive beyond the operating hours of buses and trains. You may pay in cash or credit card. Please note that your credit card must be registered on the app already before leaving your home country if the registration requires an OTP that will be sent to your registered mobile number. We thought of using this method, but we decided against it when we read online about incidents of toll fee overcharging. Based on the information online, the toll fee is added on the Grab app by the end of the ride, but we're not sure if it's automatic or manually done by the driver. For AAR, we don't know how it works. If it really happens, we're sure it doesn't happen to everyone. Either way, we did not want to take the risk. Those are your options to travel between the airport and the city. Now in terms of traveling around the city, it's convenient and affordable to either take the trains or book a car on Grab or AAR. There are buses, but we only experienced taking the bus when we went to Putrajaya, which we will share on our post about our day trip to Putrajaya. The Grab fare in Malaysia is a lot cheaper than the Philippines. Sometimes AAR fare is even cheaper. Our 4.5-kilometer ride from KL Central to the hotel was just 6 ringgit, or like 1 US dollar and 30 cents on AAR. We were able to use a promo code that deducted 3 ringgit, so we just paid 3 ringgit. Grab or AAR is the best option if your destination is far from any train station, like the National Mosque and KL Tower, but it is not the most time efficient. Six out of the six times we booked a Grab or AAR car in KL, the waiting time was between 18 to 26 minutes. We ended up canceling two of them since it would be faster to take the train instead. It seems the demand is too high but they don't have enough drivers or cars. It is more time efficient and cheaper to take the train. The most expensive we paid on a train ride was an eight-stop ride for 2.7 ringgit. You can use this fare calculator to know and estimate your expenses for train rides. It will also help you estimate how much you would need to load on your TNG card if you want to use one. Now let's talk about the standard Touch and Go or TNG card. It can be used to pay public transportation fares, parking fees, toll fees, and to purchase in some retail stores. In our case, we only used it in public transportation. Fares are quite cheaper than buying tickets for every ride. Given that it costs 10 ringgit, we didn't really have any savings, but we mainly got it because it is more convenient and time-saving. Should you decide to buy a TNG card, you can buy it in different locations including LRT stations. Since we've read that it's often sold out and we experience the same in KL Central, we'll just share here where you can have a more guaranteed purchase at the Touch and Go store in Level 2 of New Central. You can go directly at that machine. It only accepts bills. 
You can load or reactivate an inactive card here. You can load in increments of 10 ringgit, and the machine returns the change when you entered a bigger bill. Having a TNG card was so convenient especially when we need to transfer train lines. But if you want to save money and you think you will only take the train a few times, it is more cost-effective to just buy single-trip tickets. That's about it on navigating around the city. We will share about other transportation-related information and tips on our posts about our day trip to Genting Highlands and Putrajaya. Now what are the things we recommend that you include when you pack for your trip to KL? First is the insulated water flask. It's hot and humid in Malaysia. It's a necessity to have some cold water with you. When the flask gets empty, we buy a 1.5-liter bottle of water, fill the flask, and drink the rest in the bottle first. This way is cheaper and we throw less plastic trash in the process. Still, because of the heat and humidity, it's critical to bring a fan. It helps a lot in cooling you down especially while outdoors. Next essential thing to have is an umbrella. This will protect you from the scorching heat of the sun. Even my companion who doesn't get bothered with some sun didn't resist when I covered him while walking outside. Also, it rains a lot in Malaysia. During our trip, it always rained in the afternoon and sometimes until early evening. Speaking of rain, it's recommended that you wear waterproof or water-resistant shoes to keep your feet dry. Sidewalks can be laden by different sorts of human excretions at night, and stepping on puddles of water while raining is not something you would want. You may also do a lot of walking, so better wear something comfortable. Next, we also recommend having some wet wipes. You might be eating some Ramly burger and it's a good but pretty messy food to eat. Also, it's common to eat in Malaysia with your bare hands, so it would be nice to have some wipes handy. Speaking of food, a lot of Indian and Malay food dishes are spicy. You may want to bring some antacids just in case you overestimate your tolerance for spice. Also, it's nice to experience eating different street food and in hole in the wall places. It would not hurt to have some medications for diarrhea just in case you get unfortunate. Next is some eco bags. We always bring at least one eco bag everywhere for whatever we will buy. The primary reason is to reduce plastic trash. This little effort goes a long way over time. Also, if you're planning to visit a mosque or temple that would require you to remove your shoes, you may not want to leave your shoes at the footwear rack. Especially when you're wearing some pricey shoes and you don't want to worry about losing them, an eco bag would be handy. And lastly, speaking of visiting a mosque, everyone is required to wear pants and women must cover their arms and head. They lend hooded robes for visitors. But if you're like us who are not comfortable wearing something that was worn by other people, you may want to pack some pants and a lightweight hooded jacket. This will also be useful if you will go to Ginting Highlands on a chilly day. Those are the items you may want to include when you pack for your KL trip. Now as visitors, we must have some awareness and show respect for local customs. Malaysia is a multicultural and multireligious country. We need to be cautious of our actions to avoid offending different religions, namely the Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhist Chinese people respectively. We would like to share some common do's and don'ts to keep in mind when visiting Malaysia in general. First is in terms of interacting with the locals. Malaysians are friendly people. Greeting them or nodding with a smile would be nice. Ethic Malay, Indian, and Chinese people may have different ways of greeting. You may either find out about them or simply smile and nod. But avoid making long eye contact to avoid any misunderstanding, especially towards the opposite sex. Next, avoid physical contact like doing shake hands, especially with a Muslim woman. Better keep your hands to yourself to avoid any misunderstanding. And lastly, do not touch someone's head even as a friendly gesture, not even pat a child's head. In Malaysia, the head is the most sacred part of the body. Next is the do's and don'ts related to eating and drinking. Be aware of the type of restaurant or food stall you're dealing with and what type of meat they do not serve. If it's a Muslim or halal place, there is no pork. If it's Hindu, there is no beef. It would be disrespectful to even ask if they have it in the menu. Also, show respect by not eating their respective forbidden meat in their presence. It is common for Malaysians to use their bare hands in eating, but they can only use the right hand. It is a no-no in Islam and Hinduism to use your left hand for eating because they consider the left hand unclean, and it is offensive if you do it. Being a left-handed person myself, I just used utensils all the time. Hopefully I didn't offend them too much. By the way, using the right hand is not just applicable to eating but to other things as well, like passing or receiving something. 
I have violated it a couple of times when paying for something since I instinctively use my left hand, but I apologize whenever I realize it. Now when it comes to drinking, don't just drink alcohol anywhere. Drinking alcoholic beverages is allowed in Malaysia. But since it is a predominantly Muslim country, it is not widely accepted. Best that you do it in permitted restaurants or places only. Now some things to keep in mind when visiting a mosque or temple. Wear proper clothing when visiting any prayer of worship. Popular mosques in Malaysia lend robes to visitors. The hood is provided to keep the head of women covered. Wear them at all times especially while in the prayer area. In a Hindu temple like the Bata Caves, women must cover legs, shoulder, and back. Remove your footwear upon entering the designated area in a mosque or temple. There would be signs to remind you when and where you should remove them. Behave accordingly when in a place of worship. Keep your voice low to show respect to the place in those praying. Be aware of the restricted areas and stay out of them. And don't do these gestures in a mosque. There are other things to keep in mind to show respect to the locals. Do not take pictures of anyone without their consent. Malaysians find it rude, invasive, and disrespectful to take someone's picture without their consent. Always ask permission first. Whichever country we visit to show respect, we always ask permission before taking a picture of them, their products, or place of business. Next, don't use your fingers to call someone. It's considered impolite. Better to raise your hand to call their attention and use your whole hand to gesture them to come over. Next, do not point with your feet. Feet are considered unclean in Malaysia, so avoid pointing at people or objects with them. Avoid public displays of affection like kissing and hugging in Malaysia. It is not common among locals and they may feel uncomfortable seeing such actions. It's best to respect their customs by not being too lovey-dovey in public places. Lastly, don't disrespect the royal family and discuss religion or politics with the locals. These are sensitive matters. Being multicultural and multireligious, they are respectful of each other. Don't try to stir up anything. Just avoid them. Period. Those are some of the do's and don'ts we need to keep in mind when visiting Malaysia. Always remember, whenever we visit another country, we should not expect them to understand our ignorance. It is on us to do some basic research about their culture. Bottom line, it's all about respect. We hope we were able to give you some useful tips for your trip to Kuala Lumpur. If you find this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and watch out for the other posts on our KL Travel Series. Till the next one. Thanks for watching.